Hey guys, welcome to Johnny Nomad Presents. I got a special, special fucking guest, man. Um, I grew up with this cat all the way back, I think from the seventh grade. Um, from Thompson Thompson's Projects. One of my best friends ever. Um, Daniel Vega, better known as Vega. <laughs> <laughs> The that's one and only. Yeah, so that's what we always called him was Vega. That was it. Especially when Street Fighter was hot. Oh man, forget about it. It was over. <laughs> so yo, yo, V, what's going on, man? Not much, man. You just uh reconnecting, um, reviving. Um I like that reviving. Like, yeah. You know, it's uh it's they always say, you know, you can always you always vibe with somebody um that you're really good friends with and it's like you never you guys never left like, like we never left you know? yeah no absolutely I, I think throughout the years you know we always kept in contact throughout the years of course we would go for years without talking to each other and because life happens right it's just uh right. and that's normal shit but when my parents were passing the first person i called was was, was vega and um he was a part of that you know what I'm saying? Uh, he helped me through that 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 part. Um, and then, of course, you know, life happens again. You tend to fall off. Because we're also, just give people some context as well. I'm over in Atlanta in the south. He's always on, I guess, what, it's the Midwest. It's not so, it's the West Coast, probably. It's, it's, he lives in Las, Las Vegas. Um, so between different time zones, uh, different parts of the country, it does make it a little bit harder. Um not to say we can't do better, though. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But it does make it difficult. Because I haven't been in your life for a little bit. And it's, it's like, you know, and it's cool because we can always talk like we are now. Like, we just pick up from where we left off. Um, but there's always this gap of saying, damn, you know, this was this is my boy. Not was, but is. This is my boy. And I've missed out on so much of your life that I want to apologize to you. I really do. Um, because the fact of the matter that I wasn't man enough to keep together with the 148 fam. 148 fam, um, to give people some more context, is this playground. Well, not even a playground. It's a fucking parking lot, really. Um, of of a school. It was a special special needs school, I believe, right? And all it had was a handball court. That was it. And adjacent to it was a was an apartment building. And that was really, I think, and then later on, they had one of building a playground later on on it. Really small, though, in a corner of the lot. So this was really like our sand lot, like we spoke about yesterday. This was our sand lot without the sand. <laughs> and it, was, uh, it was the sandless lot. The sandless lot. And, um, you know, it was like maybe about seven, eight of us that we all chilled, and then more people started coming in in the neighborhood when they built up the new um, the new houses and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um and we added more people to the fam, of course. And 148 was the actual address <laughs> of of that of that spot of the of the lot. And um, we came up with fam because we were all family. And we played football and stickball, and we hung out there, drank there, smoked there. We <laughs> we, yeah. we would meet there. Like we, I, cause from my window, I can actually see. I lived on the 11th floor in Tompkins Project. Shout out to, to Tompkins Projects in Best Eye. And um, I can see from my window if they were there or not, because it was a straight shot from my window. So I knew if they were there, because this was before cell phones, people. You know what I'm saying? So you either had to find your boys, or you go to the crib knocking the fucking door. <laughs> and everybody had a everybody had a different ringtone. Yes. The call. Yes. yes. And uh, if you heard that call, you'd be like, nah, I ain't fucking waiting today. Oh, can I curse on this? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and it's like, like, man, this dude is calling me right now. I'm good. Right. You know what I mean? And that's when we had beepers too, right? So that's when we knew were messages and backwards lettering and shit like that. Yeah. Um, and then the whistle could be always, always holler at each other. You and Ace lives on the second floor, so I would just scream at y'all just to come down instead of me going up the steps. You know, so it was really some real Brooklyn shit. But back to my apology, bro. Like, you know, I, not just you, but to the whole fam. I hope the whole fam listens to this as well, that... I could have done a better job throughout the years because I was always a loner. I was always an, a nomad. Right. You know what I'm saying? That was that was always my thing. Even though I had great friends, 
when I left the projects in the beginning, I was very young. I had just got my ex-wife pregnant. I was, what, 17, 18 years old. Danny was kind of pissed off at me. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, we went to a whole fucking discussion. We, it got kind of heated. You know, he was mad disappointed or whatever. But, um, you know, I had to get my own apartment because my parents kicked me out. They were like, yo, you want to get your girl pregnant? Then go ahead and uh, get your own shit. So did that. And, you know, I was always career mind. I was always career minded. So long story short, guys, like, you know, I was always in and out. And um, Danny and the team were still there for me whenever I did come back. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I did miss out on a lot of, of stuff together. Um, and because of my lack of communication, um, you know, relationships weren't burned, but they became distant. You know what I'm saying? Um, but to reconnect with everyone and reconnecting with you. Especially, especially in the time where you're going through a change, right? Right, and um, but, uh, but uh, before we move forward on that, Ralph, no, yeah, I was, um, I was gonna, I was gonna go back a lot more to what took you to Vegas. What took me to Vegas was New York, and uh, you know, over the years and being in Vegas, you know, saying I noticed that. Yes, I wanted a change in my life. I wanted to see more because what people would never realize about living in the projects is the projects will give you everything. And what I mean by that is it is a block that is meant to confine you. So they give you they give you everything that you need. They put why would they put the entertainment in the center of the block? Because they want everybody to go to the center because they don't want anybody to leave. Exactly. Um, Explain that more to people who don't, who don't know what the projects look like, though. Right. So the projects are like you know, people call it the projects. They call it co-ops. They call it you know some places you know they could call it condos now. Um, and you know there's, there's different various names and the project is, is it's you know that's what we call it because in a sense symbolically um we are a project correct you know, that's our, right our, our, based our, off of history culture. correct and then based off of history the the public housing was was deemed a project and mm-hmm. that's why you have the pro the housing housing projects because that didn't exist before now as far as stature these are 20 story buildings so people can understand you know you have 20 floors with up to five families a floor five apartments per floor asin's building i remember had what eight eight apartments his building was wider and bigger his, right. his building was massive so think about that folks you're looking at maybe thousands of people living in this one building and we had wow i think we had maybe 20 buildings on the block you know what i'm saying so this thing about the population wise like danny's trying to explain vegas trying to explain about keeping the center as as a kind of a, a pop, like almost like, think, of, think of a jail. You have metal walls, right? Concrete walls, metal doors, metal window frames, metal um, guards on the window so you won't jump out, right? Um, and you're surrounded by fucking concrete. What, what does that say to you? And the courtyards in the middle. What does that, what does that sound like to you? <laughs> right. It's uh, it's preparing you for the inevitable. Um, you know, you live in there, you know, your entire life. Um, you know, you possibly really don't have any option, but, you know, it's either dead or in jail, you know, and that's a true statement. You know, that, that's a true statement. Or do you want to rise above and escape? And that's something that, you know, we chose. You know, we chose to escape because not only were we escaping mentally, you know, we had to escape physically. And not everybody makes it. Right. You know, not everybody gets to escape. You're saying they, you know, you know, like, like I mentioned, you know, how many people did we grow well with that were in and out of jail? Oh, tons, man. Tons. Yeah. It you was know? always like, it's like when, they, when they got out, it was like home- homecoming. <laughs> yeah. When they got out, they were like, oh, yo, yeah, yeah, good to see everybody. But they go right back in yeah, because exactly. they, they were uncomfortable. Yep. Um, but, you know, just to go back on, 
even so, like, you know, how, how they built and how everything's convenient. You know, they got the bodegas on the corner. They got, you know, sometimes they have, like, the 99 cent mark. Well, it was a 99 cent store back in the day. It was called The Spot. Yo, just go to the spot. You know what I'm saying? They have, right. you know, they go over there. You're saying, yo, you got your 25 cent Lucy's. Right. Uh, if anybody doesn't know what Lucy's is, I know they're they're legal in a lot of places now. And so Lucy's is basically just a loose cigarette. Right. Um, and you know, well, like everybody, you know, you know, say, oh, just go buy these Lucy's. You know, nobody really smoked in our crew, which was a little weird. Um, cigarettes, anyway. Um, we 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 were chimneys. Um, well, well, me anyway. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I, I remember smoking so much I had purple lips. Yeah, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty bad, uh, and uh, it wasn't like this great Cali weed either. You know, what I'm saying it was like some straight backyard Jamaican boogie. You mean that? Yeah. You know, had more seeds than you know uh, a, a <laughs> yeah, person on welfare. You mean? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> So it was, uh, it, you know, it was interesting because, you know, with that and, you know, just uh, trying to scrimmage up, you know, uh, a couple of coins here and there to go buy, you know, quarter waters or AKA That's right. uh, diabetes water, yeah. um, flower seeds. Uh, my particular favorite was Chico sticks. Yep. Uh, there were 10 minutes. And uh, don't forget but ice, bro. But ice, but ice was you know you know everyone's you know it's funny because everyone was pretty much a a, a drinker. That we were all drinkers. We yeah, were we're all, all, like, yeah. I was more of the smoker. I, I'll have like a beer here and there, but you know, even to this day, I can't really, you know, I personally, you know, to give it a little bit of you know what you know reconnecting with um, uh, Johnny here and. You know, I, 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 I've been going through a phase myself and, you know, a lot of people are scared of the journey um, because it, take, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and, we'll, you know, we'll get into that as well. Um, but, you know, Johnny, he, he took his journey early and, you know, he, well, his first journey, you know, his first journey of being a young parent and he had to get, you know, he immediately had to get responsible. And the reason I was upset was because he didn't live his life. You know, um, it was, you know, we had all these things planned out and then he went and, you know, got a girlfriend and, you know, I wasn't mad about him getting laid on a regular, like, yo, you know, my dude, he said, that's the goal. Plus she was older. Right. You know I mean, she was in so college, was like, man. I was 15, yeah, she, was she was in, in college. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, yo, my dude, yo, go get it. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, just be careful and, you know, um, you know, use protection. Of course, uh, he didn't do any of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and But, you know, the great thing about it, you know what I'm saying, like, he still has this great relationship. Um, and he has his, you know, wonderful daughter as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, it took... 27 odd years, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it's still developing, but you know, it's just, you know, I, 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 I felt like he missed out, you know I mean, on, on all this stuff, but in reality is, you know, I missed out, you know what I'm saying? I missed out on uh, a lot of things that, you know, uh, we disconnected on, um, but I also respect a lot of things that, you know, that he's done in his life and, you know, I do accept his apology, um, but I also want to apologize as well because, you know, there's always two parties in the apology. Right. You know I mean? And, you know, Ralph has accepted his responsibility and his accountability, and I have to accept mine as well because I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, yeah, dogs were sad. No, nah, nah, man, you said, I, I want to apologize to Ralph, too, because, yeah, we disconnected on a lot of levels. Mm-hmm. On a lot of levels, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm not going to say that we missed out because everything happens for a reason. Right. Um, so maybe there's some things that I probably didn't want to know 
Oh, there's some and there's some things that he didn't want to know about my life as well. Um, but you know, we're here now, and that's what counts. And it's all about living in the moment. And you know, when he came to me about this podcast, and I wanted to really reach out and really just really tell my story, you know, and that's what it's about. It's telling your story and seeing how many lives can you really touch with this story. Right. And, you know, that's what it's about. You're saying is, 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 you know, I always have the saying, you know, my time on this earth is to learn, teach, inspire. And because I'm learning every day, but I do feel like, I'm obligated to go out and teach what I learned and inspire others. And that's my mantra in life. So how do you plan on doing that? You know, that's been the, that's been the burning question, you know, in, in, in the last couple of years for myself and, you know, looking at different outlets and, you know, I love doing the one-on-ones and, you know, really touching and really honing, like, you know, and grasping what this person is going through. But what I wasn't realizing is that I was going through some stuff. And when I realized that, you know, I really wanted to, you know, impact lives and really tell my story, you know, I, I would, you know, I was getting frustrated because, you know what I'm saying, I wanted to hit the masses. And in order to hit the masses, you really have to know who you are as a person. And I wasn't able to do that. And that's what frustrated me. It frustrated me that I didn't know myself as a person. Not only did I not know myself as a person, but I didn't love myself as a person. And that really took a toll on me. And, you know, the journey that I, that I started, you know, happened about four years ago, from the same time that, you know, I got married. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I was working, you know, working in Las Vegas, you know, I'm in the hospitality um, industry. So some people that don't know hospitality, hospitality, you know, it's, you know, it could be anything, but and in, in, in my field, I'm in the restaurant industry. And I have a dear uh, love and respect for the restaurant industry because it allowed me to get off the streets. It also gave me the chance to give myself an opportunity. Um, it also, you know, versed me in, you know, being versatile as well. You know, I was able to really connect with different lives and, you know, and different characters. And um, I was really able to hone my craft and hone my craft as being able to talk to people, which to this day allows me to speak to everyone. Because I understand and I can pretty much conversate with, um, with the best of them. Um, Where, where do you see, or how did you notice that you didn't love yourself? When, when was that time you just like, because you, you go through life, right? Everyday routine. And when did you notice you wasn't doing any self-care? You wasn't doing no self-maintenance? Because I was thinking about everybody else. You know, we, we, you know, this, 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 this term now is you know it's it, it's it's a very popular term and um i always i always get it the, the letters mixed up because i'm dyslexic and but they say most geniuses are dyslexic so i'm 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 a i'm a i said that so the 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 term everyone knows uh PTSD. Correct. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're starting to label a lot of, you know, combat veterans that come over, you know, saying because they experience these, you know, these uh, these traumatic events. Absolutely. Um, and what 
we don't realize, you know, growing up where we grew up, that was, and not Traumatic. to take away from, you know, from, from, from what these guys have been through, because, you know, these guys have been shot at, been in war zones, they've seen people get killed, they've, uh, uh, no, it's, 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 those are life-changing events. Um, some of them have unfortunately lost limbs. They've lost friends. They, you know, what I'm saying like you, you name it. And there's no, uh, there's no virtual reality game out there that could put you through that. No, I think the most part, too, I think people need to understand that PTSD is not just for military veterans. This is just a name exactly. that that the that the military gave it. They used to call it some other ship in the past several times before. They always wound up changing the name. But pretty much it's anxiety and flashbacks that's triggered by a trauma, a traumatic event. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And and this could be for anyone. This could be um, a harbor car crash. This can be, you know, um, maybe you getting attacked by someone, being robbed or mugged. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, it could be death in the family. You know what I'm saying? Um, it could be a, numerous things that that's, that that made you react in a certain way that has prolonged and you prolonged you from moving on and it, and it stays with you unless you get proper help and learn how to deal with the anxiety or the flashbacks that you have from that so correct me if i'm wrong d, d you know what i'm saying so no you're, you're absolutely correct 100 uh, percent. and um you know it wasn't until we realized wow this is an actual term all of us has gone through this. Literally. All of us have it. I know, I know, I know, I know. I have it. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, you know, we had to have. You no, know, I, I remember. I remember. I don't know if sure you remember Jimmy. Jimmy lived in the in the buildings with Ito across the street from the projects. Yes. And uh, Jimmy got shot in the mouth. He was playing Russian roulette with his own his own cousins. Um, and then we just got a junior high school. Yeah. For other people around the country, middle school. We back in New York, New York right. we called junior high school. And we just started high school. And um me and Jimmy were so fucking tight. Like we were super tight. And uh he passed. I was and I was dumbstruck. I was like, what the fuck? Um then you in the summertime especially, you have your project wars. And what what Vega was explaining in the beginning about the courtyard being in the middle of the projects, that's where you saw a lot of death. You know, I, I, I was glad I was, I, I was glad I lived on the 11th floor so the bullets couldn't reach me, but yeah. I can look out my window, I can see people shooting at each other. I can see the flashes, I can see people falling, you know, and you know, D, there's plenty of times that, you know, cops come at the middle of the night or that morning and it's, it's closed off because they had to move, move a body. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or you're trying to walk across the, the buildings because the elevators were, were broken on purpose by the, the stick-up kids, and they want you to go down or go across the roof so they can fuck you up, do what they need to do with you, or there's crackheads up there too. Like, so you, you're dodging all the stuff and it stays with you. Um, you know, we had a view of Manhattan from from where we were at, and it was kind of distant. You know, you see it through the smog or whatever, and you kind of knew that you, you didn't belong there. Just because of where you came from in Brooklyn, that you knew you wasn't wanted there, and you know, I think I think you and I were the only, or truly ones that actually you started going to the city to expand because everybody else wanted to stay on the block all the time, and you and I would go to Canal Street, <laughs> we would just jump on a train, and we would be we would be amazed about what what the fuck that the city has. Yeah. Um. And then to come back to the block, it was like, holy shit, like, there's more out there, but I'm here. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, so when, when, for me, like, is, what stuck with me the most was not just Jimmy's death, but also Asen. Asen was a dear friend for all of us, all, all our best friends. Um, he was a cat that really brought all of us together. You know what I'm saying? And um, he was, what, 20? Yeah, 23. Yeah, 20. This was back in 2000. 
One. One. It was wrapped in 9-11, October of, of, of 2001, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he was actually working with me. I was a manager. I'm not going to say for the company. Uh, he worked with me. I was I was his manager. And uh, we always helped each other out, legged each other up. And um, when I was down and out, I didn't have a job. And I had to move back to the projects because me and my ex-wife at the time kind of had to like, split. Uh, Asen would, would throw me 400 bucks here, $500 there. He'd be like, yo, go get your, your seed, you know, some clothes, some pampers, whatever she needs, bro. It was, it was a never pay me back type of thing with us. If we all ever needed something, we were just there for each other. And we were young, you know, we were young motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying? So, so for us to have that mentality and how tight we were was a really a dope situation because we were a family, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, to, with Asen, he was at work. He was mad thirsty all of a sudden. He started buying mad drinks. He lined them up against the counters. There's so, so many fucking drinks on the counter. Just bottles of Gatorade and water and juice and just you name it. He had it. I was like, damn, bro. You fucking camel right now. <laughs> and um, yeah. he just was like, nah, nah, nah I just don't, I don't, I don't know. It's going on so thirsty. He's going to the bathroom. And within that week, he went up passing of diabetes. He, did, he wasn't aware he had diabetes. Um, I remember he did go to the doctor, I want to say maybe a few weeks before. And I want to say that the, they, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I, think I want to say they misdiagnosed him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because he had a he had a, a, a cut, like he had a, like an injury of some kind, and it wasn't healing. And for people who know about diabetics, diabetics have a tough time healing. And I want to say they diagnosed him with something else. They sent a fucking telegram after his death <laughs> and um could have um, been prevented it could have been prevented definitely absolutely and just to like jump in and so what happened from my understanding is you know 18 years ago that, that was that uh so you know 2001 you know yeah. 2000 there was a uh, you know from 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 the mid 90s to you know there was there was an epidemic you know yeah we all know what the epidemic is uh if you don't know what it is it was aids um, it was it was aids aids hiv uh um we we had multiple names for it um and uh from my understanding he had went to the you know the the, the doctors got you know, test it, you know, they didn't really un understand what it was because not only um, did we, Tomkin Projects uh, was right next to Sumner Projects and Marcy Projects. I'm pretty Correct. sure we all heard these knowing names. There's a, there's a famous rapper out there that I'm not going to say his name um, that is from Marcy Projects. So we were associated with all of this. And Mind you, statistically, our projects, Tomkin Projects, was voted in the top three for the last two plus decades of being the worst housing projects in New York City. Um, and there are hundreds, um, hundreds of housing projects. And not only... Uh, that we live in one of the worst housing projects growing up. We live, we were fortunate to live next to a hospital, literally. Across the street. Uh, across the street. <laughs> uh, so you literally had the chance to then get shot and get sewn up in probably in a two hour period. Right. Um, and be back on the streets uh, do, doing your grind. The problem was is that this particular hospital was voted the worst <laughs> yes. in New York City. It, we call it the Killer it, Hall. <laughs> call, it called the Killer Hall because you came, if you went in with a splinter, you came out ant, uh, amputated. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and the splinter like, was hey. in your big toe and you're missing your yeah. arm from your elbow. Yeah. <laughs> and you're missing, oh, well, sir, uh, we, uh, we think we're going to have to cut off your whole arm because... The, uh, the splinter traveled up from your toe to, to your penis. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> like, uh, what? 
Um, so he went in there and, you know, every, every, every nurse and every, uh, doctor there were basically, um, dropouts of, uh, <laughs> of a <our> medical school. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, they made, they misdiagnosed them. They yeah. were like, well, you know, it could be two things. Uh, you could have diabetes or you could have AIDS. That's pretty extreme. And you and, think they could, they could, and they could have tested him for, for his insulin. And they did. Right. They chose not to. And he did it. And, uh, you know, for, 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 for a young man to, you know, do the dirt that, that you know, that we've done with uh, certain females uh, and, and things of that sort. And to hear something like that will definitely uh, put a, put a, it, it, it would definitely scare the shit out of you because right. you don't want to, you don't want to be that guy. You mean, you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy that, you know, died of the monster. Right. Um, because that's the only thing that's going to be talked about. Yo, man, yo, that was my dude. Yo, but he died of the monster. That's crazy. You know mean, right. um, and so that's uh, he. You know, he he was afraid, and you know, like, you know, as I'm telling the story, this is the story that you know were, were told to me because at that time where everything was going on with Ace, you know, I was going through a lot of stuff, and you know, I had lost my dad, you know, a couple of years prior. Um, so, you know, Ace and you know, Ace and everybody was there for me. Everybody was there for me. Um, I was going through a rough time, and I went through a rough time for. The next 21 years. And, you know, I hated the world when my, when I, my dad passed away. Right. I hated the world. Um, I hated... I hated my dad, which was the crazy part. I hated my dad for a long time because I felt like he cheated me. How old was your dad when he passed away? 56. My dad so he, was 56 years old. So he was young. He was young. My dad was young. Um, but my dad... My dad was a man. And... I'm going to emphasize the word man. Because I don't think we know... As men today... What that means. No. And, no uh, we don't. Your father, your father never fucking smiled. <laughs> my dad never smiled, but my dad was an OG. Yeah, my dad. I can tell you right now. I'll put money on it. My dad was the first one rocking slacks and sneakers. Yeah. My dad did not own a pair of jeans. He always wore a Kango hat or, or a golfer's cap. Um, or whatever you call those things. Mm -hmm. Um, always had a members only. Yeah. Jacket. Um, and he rocked the Tigres all day mm -hmm. long. All day I, long. You saying? Every time I would go to Danny's house, I knock on the door. Danny lives on the second floor. And I would knock on the door. He opened the door. And he'll look at me. He was like, go in the living room. And I, Cause I wasn't allowed to walk through the house. So I had to go to the living room. <laughs> And he just be, he had this mean ass grill. He'd just be looking at me, man, because he'd be sitting at the table, and then he'd he'd be mad because I I didn't speak Spanish. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mind you, we're the worst. Like, okay, let, 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 let's 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 harp on that topic real quick. That uh, Johnny. All right. There is Puerto Ricans all over New York City, right? Yes. And you know, uh. Just to give you a little background, you know, saying on, uh, you know, uh, my wife, we we since separated slash don't really know what the future holds for us type thing. You know, we had to take a little break. Um, she's from Estonia, right? Estonia is this country right over Latvia, right off the Baltic Sea. Um, so they speak Russian? She's from Russian descent. Okay. She speaks Russian. She speaks Estonian. She knows five different languages. She probably knows Spanish better than me, which is terrible. <laughs> um, 
um but uh extremely extremely bright girl um you know and uh they they grew up a certain way as well so i'm trying to she's like you know she makes these comments and jokes all the time she'd be like oh you know you're gonna be you know out on the parade you know you know listening to salsa you know with your puerto rican flag and that, that, that you know just that you know and i'm just like Nah, I think you're talking about somebody from the Bronx. <laughs> and you know, that is an ongoing, it's not an ongoing joke, number one, because it's true. Yeah. And there are different type of Puerto Ricans in, uh, in, in, in New York. Like, Brooklyn Puerto Ricans are basically brothers. Right. Right. Uh, we're all in the same, right? Um, Staten Island because that's not even a borough. Um, <laughs> right, it doesn't it's just, count. It's just, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a garbage dump. Um, yeah, it really is. No, no disrespect, you know, what I'm saying to Staten Island because the best thing that came out of Staten Island, everyone knows, is Wu Tang. Exactly. And Wu Tang, uh, is top group of all time in any universe. I don't care. I don't care what, what you say. Correct. Um, agree. Right. The Bronx Puerto Ricans are more Puerto Rican-y, we like to call them, right? Yeah. They uh, are. <laughs> you know, uh, they have the, you know, they have the flags waving. You know, they have the Puerto Rican hats. Um, they all look like pretty boys. Um, you know, um, they're very machismo. You know, we like yeah. to call them. You know, what I'm saying like, you know, a lot of them rock. You know. The, the button down shirts with three buttons down and the small chains and the hairy chest because that's what Puerto <laughs> Ricans are. We all have hairy chest. <laughs> that, that, that's facts. <laughs> facts. That's facts. You know I mean, I mean uh, you know, um, now Queens Puerto Ricans are a little different as well. Um, I'm not going to say that, you know, they all have gel in their hair because, you know, Johnny had gel in his hair as well, which is, uh, <laughs> which I hate it, right? Yeah. Um, when I did have hair, I was born. We both we, were involved yeah. at the same time. That's a story. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah. Um, by choice. Yeah. By choice. Um, that, that's another funny story as well. And, um, you know, Queens, are the, uh, you know, they're a little bit more pretty boys as well. You know, they, they're the ones that, uh, you know, go out with the slacks and the, and the shoes and, you know, have the matching, you know, have the matching socks with the belt type thing. Um, you know, those are Queens. And then Manhattan is, you know, can't really explain Manhattan too much, but it's all weird those Because the LES is, is really kind of like Brooklyn-esque. So an extension of Brooklyn, yes. And then you had um, Washington Heights, or, you know, uh, Spanish Harlem, where it was very... It's your, Bronx X, you know what I'm saying? Because they yeah, were close Bronx. to the Bronx. Um, but Brooklyn style altogether, we were very fashionable. So you can't, like, you knew you was from Brooklyn. Like, people knew you was from Brooklyn, right. you know, because we make sure we matched. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So if we had polo, we had polo underwear, polo socks, polo mm-hmm. kicks. We we get the polo cologne. You had you get the watch. You get the, you know you, whatever accessories you can get, you get everything. Polo if, grills. Yeah, polo grills. Like if you fucking had. Car can I, you had everything. If you had damage or used back in the day, like you would dress it up and really make it like, yo, this is the shit. Yo, I would have, I would switch like gear like twice, three times a day. Like I was notorious to going back and forth to the crib and changing, yeah. having mad kicks. That was just part of it. You know what I'm saying? And, um, right. It was, uh, it was, it was dope. And for us not to know Spanish, to go back to what you were saying, like my mother knew Spanish, my father knew Spanish. They only spoke it to the, to each other or to their siblings, so they didn't want us to fucking understand the conversation. <laughs> yeah, but, pretty but, much. Yeah, that was, and then my mother was really ghetto. My mom was ghetto as fuck, and not that she hated her own people or anything like that, but she 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 grew up in Brooklyn from the early fifties, so she wasn't up. She she didn't come off the boat. She was already embedded into the culture because my grandfather was a butcher in Brooklyn. And he left Puerto Rico to come to Brooklyn to be a butcher, have his own business. And my mother and my father grew up in Brooklyn back in the 50s and 60s when they listened to you know, rock and roll music, you know, the whole Buddy Holly and Elvis and shit. And 
they grew up like normal Americans pretty much. And there wasn't a lot of Puerto Ricans back then. Not until like mid to late 70s, that's when a lot of Puerto Ricans started coming to New York. Or started probably started really starting to grow. So um my mother didn't bother teaching us Spanish. Like I know I can't even have a conversation. I can't like and it's fucked up. I wanna learn actually I want to learn Spanish. Um as as I've gotten older. Come on I can cook my ass off. I can cook all the Spanish food, I can cook all the Puerto Rican food you want, but um don't ask me what fucking Mark Anthony's fucking singer. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like he's probably singing about some chick. I don't know. <laughs> right, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the beat. Yeah, I, like yo, this dude can move. You mean? <laughs> so, so what, what was Wifey's point to you? That was she, were you not Puerto Rican to her then? Because she would, she would just like you know you don't just you just don't seem like you know these Puerto Ricans that you know I hear about. Um, and I'm just like no, because I'm from Brooklyn. She was like, what's what's that even mean? I'm like. Well, would you would you like me to call you Georgian? Right. You know, and calling a, a Russian Georgian is like that's insulting. You know, it's not, yeah, it's, not the, might, it's not it's not the the state Georgia where Atlanta's at. It's the country no, Georgia a, in Eastern yeah. Europe. Right. You know, you might as well just cut off her leg. Um, and she was like, "Don't ever call me that." I was like, "Well, don't ever call me." You know, a Puerto Rican from the Bronx, because it's basically it's, it's the same insult, right? Um, not insult, but you know, to us, you know, saying we're very distinctive. No disrespect to people from the Bronx or anything like that, but we're just Brooklyn very we're we're, 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 di- we're we're very different. Yeah, we're we're extremely different. We're very um, proud of where we come from in Brooklyn. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, what I'm saying we represent Brooklyn before we represent Puerto Rico. Absolutely. Where where the Bronx will represent Puerto Rico before they represent the Bronx. Correct. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, we just we just grew up a certain way, and um, that way was all wasn't always the right way in some people's eyes. But that way paved the way to us becoming who we are now. Correct. Um, and you know, we can sit here all day long. Uh, talk about those ways, um, but you had you had to you, you had to live it and go through it to understand what you were going through. Um, no doubt. No so, doubt. So yeah. go back to the PTSD stuff. You know, you mentioned Asen. You mentioned your father, and um, how how does how does that how did that affect you then? How how did it affect you midstream in your life, and how does it affect you now, currently? How it affected me then? I didn't I didn't understand the impact because I was angry. You go you know you go through stages when you go through tra- trauma. You know, first you feel like the victim. You know, uh, because you are the victim, essentially. Right. Um, and you know you go through these stages. My dad passed away, and you know, um, my mom was sat in the course. And you know the, the 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 day my dad went to the hospital, I knew my dad was gone. Um, my family didn't accept that. The reason why is because I grew up in a very sh- not strict, but you know I grew up in a Pentecostal household, so everything was about. Uh, the Lord and Jesus and, you know, God and, you know, things of that stuff and saying, which is great because you needed some type of positivity and enlightenment growing up in the situation that we grew up in. Right. You know, everything's going to be okay. Jesus got us. And I'm like, okay, but you know, the, the dude out there right now that I'm looking at just got stabbed over, you know, because he didn't have enough money to buy crack. Um, so you know, it it it, it was very controversial, you <laughs> in, in in the household sometimes. But that's another story. So you know, my dad went to the hospital. Um, you know, my family had faith. You know, faith. You know, you know he's gonna get through this and this and that. You know, and I, you know, I I went on a separate conversation on my own to the doctor. It was like, hey, doc. You know, saying hey, what's going on? He was like, you know, he looked at me. He was like, well, you know, saying, you know, I kind of let, you know, the next second know, like your mom, your sister, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but that's my dad too. 
you know? And he was like, well, um, two of the three components to keep you alive, your dad has lost. Um, you know, he had a severe stroke. And, 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 you know, and I told him, hey, man, what's that mean? He was like, well, you know, he, you know, it's a very slight chance that, you know, he's going to get out of this. And I looked at him and I was like, cool. Because I had to prepare myself not for my dad's death because I knew my dad was dead already. I had to prepare myself for my family. And being a 19-year-old kid, you know, started going to, you know, into the workforce. You know, I've been in the workforce since I was like 16, 17. Um, you know, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, I don't know, it's the best way to explain it, it was, it was, it was surreal, but I, 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 I had her face reality at the same time, you know? Uh, I was caught in the matrix <laughs> between reality and uh, and uh, fiction. <laughs> right. Did so, you feel not to cut you off, but did you feel um, that you were cheated? I, yeah, absolutely. I felt not 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 only did I feel cheated, um, I I I I I hated I hated God. I hated God for a long time um, because, you know, I looked at God. I'm just like, oh, you got my back. That's This is how you're going to do me. This is how you're going to do me and my family. So, you know, you know, my, you know, my dad goes into the hospital July 4th. Right. But, you know, before this all happens, you're saying like, you know, I was in a, I was in the house, you know, with my dad, you know, and my dad's been, you know, feeling kind of ill like a couple of years before that he had a quadruple bypass surgery um you know he had heart disease and stuff like that and um you know that that morning like july 4th you know i'm heading out because you know july 4th you know saying everything's cracking outside you know saying people are doing fireworks you know saying we're trying to throw m80s at each other and blow each other's hands off stuff like that you know we were stupid like that you know what i mean um you know Let's see who could do this dumbest shit without getting hurt. Okay, this nigga got hurt. Everybody stop. You know I mean? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He, he fucked it up. <laughs> you went up and blew your head off, man. Man, you selfish bastard. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, you know, he calls me to the room. He's like, hey, Danny, you're saying, like, someone to go out there and be careful, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, your dad, you're saying, like, you know what? You know, you had that really shit with your dad. You're 19. You think you know it all. You know, um, my... Majority of my family had headed out to go to a, a, a church picnic. You know, that's what they did in the holidays, you know, stuff like that. They all go out picnics and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they were out of the house, right? And my dad calls me in. He's like, hey, you know what I'm saying? want to be careful, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, man, um, how's everything going? I was like, oh, you know, everything's going good. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm like, dad, these niggas going to ask me 100 questions now. You know what I'm saying? Uh, am I still messing with this girl? Blah blah blah. Make sure I wear protection. La da 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 da. Um, and he's like, "Hey, you know, what I'm saying, um, hey, I, I, I just, uh, I just want you to take care of your mom. You know, and I, I didn't understand that impact right. until decades later." Literally, decades later, because the situation like that had put me, which I didn't realize, in a PTSD state. Um, because what happens with PTSD? We bury the experience because we don't want to think about it because it was so traumatic in our life. You know I mean, so, you know, that happened. And, you know, a couple hours later, he had a stroke. You know, we found him, you know, we took him to the hospital. He was already gone. He was already in a, in, in, in a, in a coma, in a coma state. 
for him to say that to you, do you feel like he uh, he he knew something? Absolutely, because you know my mom didn't reveal a lot of the stuff until years later. Yeah, you know, saying your dad was sick and you know he used to get up and he would cough a lot, but when he would cough, he would cough up blood. Hmm. So the times that you used to hear your dad go to the, you know the the uh, bathroom at night, you know he was coughing up blood. And he didn't even tell my mom. Tell my mom one day, you know, saying, "How you know she had went? She had found, I think, blood on the side of the toilet or the sink." And she was like, "Yo, what the hell is this?" And then you know he had her to admit to. He's like, "Oh, I'm saying I've been blah blah blah." She's like, "Oh, we need to get checked out." He's like, "I'm fine." You know, old school head. Back in the, yeah, old school head. You know, what I'm saying like we we live in a completely different generation now. You know, what I'm saying um, old school heads, they 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 fought to the end. Because you weren't going to, they never trusted the doctors as well. Nah, they never went to the doctors, and they never admitted when something was wrong. Nope. And which is the wrong way to live. It's the way they, they were raised. Like as as a man, you're raised to not show any type of weakness ever. Right, and going to that phrase as a man, what what does that even mean? Don't know. I'm still trying to figure that shit out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You mean I think we 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 constantly misconstrue what being a man really is. You mean until we go through what we go through, just be like oh shit, like you know what? I got feelings too. <laughs> you mean <laughs> word for real? You mean? Yeah. And that's the first thing we say. We say it's like, yo, that shit was hurtful. Why would you say something like that to me? <laughs> you mean? And then you call you mean? <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, you're being soft. I'm like, nah, yeah. I'm being soft. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, I got feelings too. You know what I'm saying? It's like, what, what do you mean I'm being soft? You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know saying? You know, my dad passes away um, January 16th, 12 days later. You know, I get the phone call. Um, my mom is, if you ever in your life heard a silent scream, and when I mean a silent scream, everything is in slow motion. You hear this scream of pain and denial all at the same time and it is in a silent slow motion mode. You know, I can still remember that phone call and my mom getting that phone call and I'm there standing there with my mom, my mom's brother, and she let out this banshee style silent scream in slow motion that I could literally write a book about. Um, and, you know, I looked at my mom. I was like, Ma, I understand that it hurts, but it's going to be okay. I got you. And I proceeded to put my clothes on and, you know, head to the hospital. Mind you, the hospital, um, unfortunately, was Killer Hall. Um and the the, the the hospital was a block and a half away, you know, from the house. Right. And as I'm walking, one of my boys called me. He was like, yo, D, yo, you all right? You know, because he sees me. He sees me hysterical, crying. And, you know, it's my boy, Jermaine. And he was like, yo, D, what's going on? You're saying, yo, you're saying, like, I'm like, yo, man, my dad has passed. And Jermaine starts crying. And literally, Jermaine had carried me, not carried me, but you know what I'm saying, like arm to arm, like a wounded soldier, because I was wounded. Took me to the hospital. I was the first one there. And, uh, they still had, hasn't, haven't taken the tubes out of my dad. So I walk in and, you know, seeing that and still having the vivid Im like imagery in my head right now, it's crazy. And, you know, the nurse asks me, you know, hey, you know, saying what's going on? You know, saying blah, blah, blah. I tell her, you know, she was like, well, let's, let's clean him up. And uh, they clean him up and, you know, they put the, the wrapping, you know, on his head, kind of just show his face and, you know, I touched my dad and he was ice cold. And the reason I'm telling you that he's ice cold, but number one, he's dead, right? If you know anything about the body, you're saying once you 
the blood stops pumping and everything turns cold. But the symbolic thing about that was that my my dad was ice cold. And that turned me ice and that turned me ice cold for years. Because I didn't want to experience the hurt of loving anyone that much and being gypped. And the real thing talk. is too, you know, it's real talk because the, the, the similar thing happens to Asian where Asian actually found his father on the floor when he had a heart attack. And um, Asian saved his father. And I want to say probably was a couple months later is when Asian died after saving his father. Um, you know, as you talk about all this stuff, it just brings me back to, it really hit me hard because of the fact of, you no. Know, looking at how the relationship I have with my parents, how I, I saw my mother deteriorate after years of having dementia and Alzheimer's. And that was a very slow, painful death, just watching her turn that way. And then having my father, Pops, as we would call him, he wasn't my biological father, he was actually my stepfather, but I never called him my stepfather. He was always there since I can remember. Uh, before I was even born, he was around. And... um he uh he had one of having a stroke as well, and he was a huge military man. Um, he was this, this soldier, this unbeatable warrior. Like he was really born in the wrong time. He was meant to be in the, in the medieval times because all he wanted to do was fight. <laughs> um, yeah, super, he used to beat me up. Yeah, he's <laughs> super aggressive. <laughs> you know, he he would have fit in today's world. They would think he's out of his mind because <laughs> he was just this super kind of superhero guy, this super aggressive Mr. Macho of all machos and um, all he wants to do is fuck the motherfuckers up and that's what he did. Like He, he would beat up his bosses. And, and let me tell you something a little about Johnny's uh, stepdad. I'm, I'm, real quick. Any time period in, 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 in from here to the, the end of eternity, I'll put my money on this dude to beat up anybody. <laughs> yeah. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was, he had stab wounds. He had a broken finger that couldn't go back straight again because he got hit with a bat in his hand. So it stood, it stood like in a fist position, that one finger. Oh um, yeah, I remember that finger. That always yeah. freaked me out. Yeah. You know, and he, <laughs> could, he couldn't stretch it out. He would try, but it would go back to curled up again. And, um, because he, he would, yeah, he, no one in the projects fucked with him. Nobody. Like, everybody respect, even, like, even like, you know, the, the drug dealers or whatever, they they respected his ass, because he didn't give a fuck. Nope. Um, and and he wasn't, he wasn't one to walk like he was a badass. He was actually very loving to the ladies. He loved women. He was very kind to women. He was very humble. He would help a woman, you know, with their bags and groceries and stuff like that. So everybody knew about Carlos. When it came to another motherfucker, though, to a dude, he didn't play. You know what I'm saying? And he demanded, he commanded respect. It wasn't like, yeah. yo, like, maybe Let's you can talk know. about it. <laughs> yeah, it was a discussion. You're going to respect yeah. Carlos. And that's yeah. it. The only, the only talking with Carlos when he talked to you was because he had to fill out the police report because he just beat the shit out of you. Yes. That was only, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the only, only talking. Time. Yeah. Only time. And uh, he was hardcore, but he had his own PTSD. His mother, he was brought up in a, in a, in a household of, of getting beat and shit like that. So, you know, to stem to go back to your father, like, you know, him being so cold, it came from someplace. It stemmed from someplace. Um, not to say that they didn't love us. They were very hard men. And we are who we are today because of it. And I, I won't never change that. Right. But we also missed out on some things. We also missed out in knowing who we are. I, I think our mothers didn't get the opportunity because of the old school way of thinking. You know, as as a, as a as a female, you're allowed to be emotional. You're allowed to have these feelings. You're you're allowed to to be that. And back in the day, I was looked upon it as far as guys being pussy. And now I'm challenged with my kids as far as saying, "Hey, go ahead and cry. Go ahead and feel it." And by the back of my head, I'm damn motherfuckers, you still crying? You fucking pussy. <laughs> I'm saying that yeah. back in my head. 
you know what I'm saying? In the back of my head to my sons and my my children are are older. I don't know the 23, 19, 18, you know, and then I have I have little ones too now. So it's like, yo, like it's um it's 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 bugged out and I had to I had to retrain myself how to parent compared to how I trained my other three that I kind of fucked up on because they're my first three, right? So, right. but um, it's, it's difficult. But to say all that, to get back to your story, it's just the fact that times have changed. You having PTSD, recognizing it, you know, you, you pretty much cut yourself off from the world because that's when I, I didn't even know you had moved to Vegas until you were in Vegas. I didn't know I moved to Vegas so I moved to Vegas. Right. So, <laughs> what was that like? Like, what happened that you just had to get the fuck out of New York and just go? Well, real talk. Um, I got myself involved and in, in, you know into a lot of things, and you know I've I've always done well for myself. Yes. Um, you know. I have uh, I I worked at, at the time I was working for uh, a really well known prominent chef in New York, and I'm talking like, oh yeah, yeah, people know him. No, I'm talking about like top, easily top five, right? And started with this company uh, and moved myself up. You know, what I'm saying like I moved from like you know a busser to what they call you know it was, it was fine dining, right. so. Basically, what fine dining really is, uh, is instead of charging you five dollars for mushrooms, they charge you eighteen instead, right? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and only give you one. <laughs> <laughs> only give you one, right? <laughs> and uh, and and it told you it was it, it was it was sautéed with uh, butter from from a cow that had uh, three legs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the cow had to had a story. Right. The, so the, the cow, cow had a story. Had a, yeah. yeah, the cow yeah, had a, a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So. It, it actually actually spoke. It was the first uh speaking cow. <laughs> right. It, it, it was it was, very, it was very moving, you know what I mean? <laughs> Dumbass motherfucker. Um Yeah, you know saying that was fine dining, but you know, fine dining is 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 extremely interesting because you know it's it also teaches you a lot of versatility as well. But anyways. Um, you know, started working for the chef, saying, wind up, you know, taking a bartending class and started doing bartending. And actually, I'm a head bartender for three or four years. And, you know, going up for that, you know what I'm saying? I was, I was on a high. I was on a high, you know what I mean? And, but what I noticed is that there was also a need in the black market. Um, you know, these. For what exactly? For uh, booger sugar, they call it. Um, booger sugar? Yeah. Booger, booger sugar, uh, <laughs> uh, Snow White, mm -hmm. uh, what's another good name? Uh, you know, just for Coke. Yes. Right? There was a need for Coke. And me having the relationship I had with the hood was was very accessible right um and uh we like like we like to call it uh i i had a very good insight to get it at wholesale value right right um and that's what i started doing i started um providing these uh black market services to uh the market and mm -hmm. i've been became very successful at it because I'm a natural entrepreneur. And what people don't seem to realize is that, you know, when you grow up in the hood, you already got the business mentality. You yeah. mean, we just, we don't learn anything different. We learn mathematics. We learn civil engineering. Uh, we learn engineering because what do we call it? Oh shit, we ghetto rigged it. Yeah, Jerry rigged the fuck my, my out of dudes, shit. My dudes, my dudes, <laughs> it's engineering. You yeah, say exactly. The, the only thing that you didn't do was pull out a protractor, right? Exactly. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we learned all these things. And, you know, I, you know, I started to dibble and dabble in that, became very successful. Uh, but then one day I sat back and realized, oh, shit. I did all these things to get out the hood. Now I'm doing all these things to put myself back in it. Right. Because I didn't realize, you know what I'm saying, like my mentality at the time. Because going back, you know, my, my dad passed away. And then unfortunately my best friend, a, after I'm getting recovery from my dad, you know what I'm saying, like I'm good, it's not really my life, blah, 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 you know what I'm saying? I'm in a relationship, no blase blase. Um, Aison passes away. And everyone was still mourning because of 9-11. Right. Right? Granted, yo, a lot of people lost their lives. And 9-11 was also a PST, a PTSD moment for me because I saw the towers go down. So did I. I also went to the site a few hours after at night when the firefighters would put us still out of the fires. And it was just that one street with the famous photo with the, with the firefighters and, and the American flag and that little piece of the, the tower sticking back up. Yeah. Right. I passed through that. And it was me and a couple of friends. Uh, my, some of my hospitality friends, which I'm still friends to today. Passed by, and we had the windows open, and you smell the smell, fire. Yeah, you smell death. You smell burnt flesh, burnt yeah. hair. You smell death. And the block was only yay wide, but I felt like it took us a couple of hours just to pass by, it, even though it was just a couple of seconds. Right. And a couple of weeks after that, Asian passes away. And Aeson was our Twin Towers. Yeah. You know what I mean? It really was. Uh, because when he fell and died, all of us died. Because Aeson was the glue. He was He's the anchor. The one, yep. he, was the, he was the bridge to everybody because he... You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he understood everyone. And I was with Aeson the most, mm -hmm. day in, day out. We, 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 were, we were glued to the hip. Um, until he decided to get a girl. I, I got pissed off. I was just a hater. Yeah, you were. You know what I'm saying? You were. I was a hater. You, you hate on you me. I love you. You started hating Aeson. You know what I mean? He was, I was like, man, everybody got these Lindsay. girls, and blah, blah, yeah. blah, just none of that. Even though I had my girl, but I didn't really pay attention to her. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, she was annoying. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she was. Uh, I couldn't stand. She was right. I, I couldn't stand yeah. his fucking girlfriend. Oh my! Me and her didn't get along at all. Nah, she didn't. Mean, she was like, I don't know what your friends are like. That I was like, yo, because you're annoying. You're know saying like you're always harping on me. Like you show up when you're not even invited. You know what I mean? And then you're like stalking me too. Like you're outside my door. Like yo, like come on. You know what I'm saying like I, ain't, yo, I'm gonna be a man and be like, yo, I ain't gonna put no restraining on on you. But you know, you're know saying like, yo. Come on, you mean? Let it go. You know, asked a couple of times. Me and her got into it a couple of times. Like, yo, I gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like, yo, leave this nigga alone already. Like, damn. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so basically, you know, when that happened when Aeson passed, you know, the next six years was a complete blur. Uh, it, it was uh, more girls, more drugs, more money, more silly stuff. And then, you know what I'm saying, it finally hit me, you know what I'm saying, you know, when I decided to move to Vegas, I was like, man, I need to get out of New York because I wasn't taking no accountability for myself. I was right. blaming New York. I didn't blame myself. Right. So, you know, that's when I decided to come, you know, to, to Vegas about, you know, 11 and a half um, years ago now, which is crazy when I'm, when I'm saying that. Yeah, I've been in Atlanta for, uh, for 17 years. For real? Yeah, I left. I left right after nine eleven. Oh two, April of 02, I came to Atlanta. It's about eighteen Damn, years I didn't now. Know it was that long. Yeah. Shit. Um. But uh. Yeah, you know, saying I came out here. You know, saying I wanted to start a new life, and what I created for myself was completely phony. 
I had the means to create a completely phony life for myself, and I paid the price. What do you mean by that? The, 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 take us, take us to that journey. You went to Vegas. You say that you could. I went, I went to Vegas. You know, you know, uh, I, 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 I came here with blood money. Um, you know, I came here with a certain female, uh, which turned out to be, you know, a little psycho, uh, which is, I have to really think about that, you know, were they really psycho or did I make them psycho? Um, I'm, I'm gonna take a little blame for that. Um, right. And, you know, we, you know, we went through our, you know, our trials and tribulations and, you know, in Vegas and, you know, Vegas is very polished i like to call it or uh people that don't know how to read polished um, <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> <laughs> fucking stupid he has the dumbest sense of humor ever i swear to god you always have uh, <laughs> same time um, exactly so you know no vegas, vegas is it, it, it's 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 made to look more than what it is and that was perfect for me because nobody knew me out here. Um, I would say these stories about Brooklyn just to kind of like break the ice and people would be like, you didn't really live that way. And I'm just like, yeah, you're right. I'm just fucking bullshit. I heard that shit in a fucking Nas song. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of just kept it that way. You know what I mean? Right. Um, started being more involved in the hospitality field. Um because it gave me a chance to be somebody that I wasn't. You know what I mean? Because they were paying me to be an actor. But what I didn't realize is that I had a clock out. That's you deep. See? Yeah, I do. And I failed to clock out every night. I still wanted to be Daniel Vega, a hospitality expert, my entire life. I wanted to help. I wanted to show you the way. I wanted to do all these things because I didn't know the way. I didn't want to help myself. So I created a fake life for myself. And this past couple of months, my soul said, nah, nigga, this ain't the way. So it taught me a valuable lesson. And that lesson, um, I think the universe that I'm, that I'm here today to tell the story because it wants me to tell the story because a lot of people are living a fake life. My dude, one of the greatest basketball players in the world ever, Mr. 2-3, everybody wears on their feet. Mm -hmm. But you got to be great to wear those. Are you? You know, I never owned a pair of Jordans. You are wearing greatness on your feet. But yet your feet don't go nowhere. So what kind of relationships have you burned because of that? You know, I started uh, burn relationships. I think the most important one was uh, with myself. Um, and like I mentioned before, you no, know, I met this young lady. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I cheated myself. I cheated myself out of something great that I believe still could be great. Either we decide to be together or not. Um, but I, like, I, uh, for a while I hated her as well because... She knew something was wrong. And 
she said that, you know, you had to, you know, blah, 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 you know, this and that, you know, like, I'm not going to know too much detail about it, but I hated her because she wanted to know the truth. She really wanted to know who Daniel Vega was. She wanted to know Brooklyn Daniel Vega. And Brooklyn Daniel Vega, I had buried a long time ago. But Brooklyn Daniel Vega was who I was. Why were you so uncomfortable being who you were? Just because, you know, the shit that I've seen, the shit that I've done, um, the shit that I thought. So you, were you ashamed of yourself? Ashamed of I your was, I, I was. I was ashamed. I, I, I was living in shame and guilt. So you figured sh- you figured creating a new person would take all that away. Yeah, I did. But what it did was it created the biggest monster that I've ever dealt with. Because either way. You were going to love Daniel Vega. Las Vegas, Daniel Vega, or Brooklyn, Daniel Vega. It don't, it don't matter. You know I me? Mean? Because I always have a saying. If you don't want to fuck with Daniel Vega, you don't know what the fuck you want in life. Um, but Daniel Vega didn't want to fuck with Daniel Vega. So who so, the fuck do I love? So who are you now? You, you say you buried Brooklyn, Daniel Vega. You finally realized you're living a lie. So... Who are you now? I'm the resurrection. <laughs> I'm the resurrection of Brooklyn Daniel Vega. The person that understands what it takes to get what they want. But is it really that easy to just stop the lie? Is it really that easy to let that... Let Absol- that absolutely could, not. Because you, you grew that lie for so long. You were, you were in it. <clears throat> you embodied it. Is it really that easy to just drop it? Absolutely not. Because what I had to embrace was, I had to embrace forgiveness. And forgiveness sounds, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgive. You know what I'm saying? No, forgiveness is some real shit, my people out there. Forgiveness is forgetting, forgiving yourself for a lot of things. And you have to start regressing a lot of these um, thoughts you know you have to go back and be like, oh shit and what I needed to do I, I needed to embrace a different energy and that energy was going to help me get through this and I'm not talking about this happened a couple of years ago my peeps I'm talking about this is two months ago this is fresh out the box so fresh it doesn't have an expiration date Right. You mean? I'm still using this milk on my cereal type freshness. <laughs> um, you know, a certain situation happened and everything started boom. I had cl- I had clarity on my professional state, my financial state. My spiritual state and whatever other state there is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> right? Uh, my state of mind. Um, and it all hit me at the same time. And when it hit me, the last time I cried like that was at my dad's funeral. Right. Because I knew that I had to bury this man that was looking dead at me in the mirror. That man had to be buried because that man is no good. That man has no service in this world. And that took a toll on me because. Who the fuck am I then? So, you know, went back home and really started, you know, saying, mind you, the last couple of years, you know, haven't seen my family. 
you know, all these things haven't been bragged. You know what I'm saying, you know, there's, there's a lot of different stories and, you know, different excuses I can give. But you know what? I was a coward. I was a coward to go back home. And that's the truth. What, what has your family thought about that? But you being you know, distant? They, uh, they, they didn't like it. They didn't understand what was going on. They were like, oh, we just told you we're doing your own thing and blah, blah, blah. Like, we didn't know everything was crazy was going on, blah, 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 just and that. And, you know, in, you know. You know, I you know I made it to my mom about the drugs, the drug dealing, and you know, as I'm telling my mom these stories, you know, saying, you know, you know, she puts, you know, she puts her head down, and you know, her face is in her hands, so automatically I'm gonna be like, oh shit, I'm a piece of shit, cause you know my mom is crying now, right, right, but she's hurt, and. She puts her hands on her face and she raises her she raises her head with a smile and starts laughing. I'm like, your mom, why are you laughing? This is, you know, this is this is serious. I'm I'm spilling my heart out over here. You know? And she looks at me, she goes, Danny, you talking like you murdered somebody. <laughs> she like, I, I I literally thought you murdered somebody and you were on the run. <laughs> And I was just like, what? And she's like, oh, so you did what you had to do to survive? That's what we do it as humans. And I was like, damn, damn my mom's a G. For real, mom, your mom's always been a gangster, bro. Yo, I was like, she probably sold a couple of keys in her life, too. I don't know. You know what I mean? No doubt. <laughs> in Puerto Rico, that shit was gangster back in the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, doing that and, you know, kind of like really finding myself and, you know, I really needed the outlet to really tell my story. I didn't know how to do that because I'm not the most confident public speaker. You know, when I get nervous, I, you know, I start to stutter and all these crazy stuff and, you know, I, it just pisses me off. Right. So, you know, one day, you know, one day my mom is like, hey, you know, saying you really need to embrace God again. And um, now, did you become atheist, agnostic, or did you just say, just say "fuck you, God"? I just said "fuck you, God." But you did claim agnostic in the beginning, didn't you? I don't know what the fuck that means. So, agnostic is pretty much when you're not sure. Atheism is is saying, "Hey, you, there is no God," and you're, when you're agnostic, you're just saying you're just not sure. Yes, I want to say part of it was, yeah, I'm not sure. But the rest of it was, I'm not sure if I want to fuck with this nigga. Right. Because of the because, depth that was happening. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, you took my dad, you know, you took Ace, you took a couple of my other boys as well. And... You didn't replace it with anything. I thought you were the man. But what, I thought what you, you were this high what were you looking forward to? What were you looking forward to, to replace it with? The biggest sin, more deadly than the first seven. I was looking for acceptance. So as you're looking for this validation, right? You 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 looking for validation from from who, from the industry you were in, from the from the people you were chilling with, from who exactly were you looking for this? From acceptance in from the end. In the end, what I'm realizing, I was looking for acceptance for myself because I was getting all this stuff in my life, and I didn't accept love. I didn't accept happiness because I felt like I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve love. I didn't deserve happiness. I didn't deserve riches. Because I felt like a piece of shit. Don't know why. I may have a clue. I don't know. But that's the journey that I'm going on. And now just because of that, this has affected your marriage. My marriage, yes, my marriage, um, 
started failing, um, obviously before we separated back in May. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it. No, um, no, no, that's that's cool. I understand that. Um, but you know, it was started getting distant because the conversation, and you know, I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable who I was at the moment, and. I would not, never understand from a woman's perspective because I'm not a woman, right? But my guess is a woman would, wants to be with a man that's confident and knows what they want. You know what I mean? And I wasn't doing that. I wasn't making her feel... Did she, did she tell you that? Or did you in come a up sense, with that? Yes. In a sense, yes and no. Um, because I didn't understand what I was going through. And I saw in her eyes that, you know, she was also, she exuded a lot of energy on me. And she started to become down and depressed and stuff like that. And I didn't want that because what I didn't realize is that there was no energy on this planet that could help me through what I was what I was going through. And she exhausted all her energy because she herself was going through some stuff. You know what I mean? Right. So her being a natural nurturer, she needed healing. Me being a natural healer, I needed nurturing. And it was just it was just too much. It was just too much. And um, you know, we, you know. Most people have something that you know why you know why this place. You know, most marriages, you know, close to seventy percent of them, you know, they fail because of financial ruins. Correct. Economics right? always plays a big factor, yeah. A big factor, right? We never had that. We never really argued. Um, we uh, there was a couple of things here there, but I can't even give you a a a a a, a, a solid answer of why. You mean? But, but that even then, you still wasn't being yourself, right? I wasn't being myself. No, absolutely not. And she was aware something was up, but she never got. She to knew know. something was up because you know she's unfortunately. So, so was that very fair? <laughs> was that fair on your part to deceive her? No, absolutely not. And I started feeling like a, you know, like a piece of shit because I'm like, man. I was scared to show her the Brooklyn Daniel Bay because she has saw glimpses of it here and there, but she didn't get the full logistics of it. You know what I mean? Um, but I knew at the end that she didn't care about all of that. She just really wanted to be with me. But what I didn't want to tell her is that I didn't want to be with me. So as you, you know went through all, the, all these years and, pretending, right, and and not being the person you should have been, have you missed out on on growth because you've been living this false life? So absolutely, you haven't been growing the way you should have been growing. So, what does that look like? I for was you now? I was I was afraid to 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 be great. That's number one off the bat. Um, and I had to embrace greatness these last couple of weeks. And that may sound like a somewhat of an easy task, but I really embracing greatness is embracing responsibility. And I've always been responsible my entire life. You know what I mean? Um, but to accept that this man that sits in front of me right now is capable of making such a big impact. Are you ready for that? And embracing, you know, embracing God again and really asking for his energy and meditating and stuff like that. I've really been embracing this. And so what I started doing was writing poetry. Um, I've always loved poetry. I always loved writing. Um, and Which I got to say was, real quick. I, you know, Vega, let me read some of his poetry and it's, um, it's, it's, it's bombs, fire. You know what I'm saying? Um he uh 
when you read his poetry, you can really sell that it looks like he's finally being himself. And that was really cool to read for me when I, I got it yesterday. And uh, when you allowed me to read it, and um, it was there. I, I I know this person. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. This is this is the cat I grew up with. You know what I'm saying? Because um, we all saw those funny movies, right? Where everybody's smoking weed, mm-hmm. everybody always jokes, "Man, you be you be talking some like scientific shit." Like that was me. Yeah. That was me. That was me. That was me in the in, in the back hallways. I, I I was I was the project prophet. Yeah. You know. Um. Cause we all we all had different things. Jermaine was crazy. Jermaine was chilling the tree in the treetops with his ninja outfit. He still does. I know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Me and Jerome used to get into to racial arguments all the time. He um, still does. Yeah. Um, Anthony was a pretty boy, but so was Nalo. Right? Still are. Um, handsome, handsome ass motherfuckers. Yeah, exactly. They, they always were big players, always had mad chicks, mad bitches, whatever. Um, and not to say that we're bad looking either, because we all, they used to call me handsome. Um, right. Uh, it was a matter of who else we had. Ace and. Asa was this big motherfucker, but he he would bag bitches. Like, we all bag bitches. It was then we had Tim. Tim was like Bill Bellamy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Hey, well, because we went to him first, and then it like trickled down to everybody else. You know what I'm yes. saying? So we fucking walking last because you mean you're like why? It's like it's walking last because you know we got to fucking bag bag him first. Yeah. Um, he was the most shy of everybody, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Then we had Edgar as well, right? Edgar, yeah. yeah Edgar is uh Edgar uh it, it's a great story that we need to get on as well. So we need to get him on then, man. Like I'm gonna try to get everybody if I can get one for your fam and get everybody on. I'm trying to get Ethan on. I'm really contacting him. Um you know, he has a great story as well. But um that's a good subject though. But um you know <sighs> I have to say, like, I, I do relate to a lot that um, you've been speaking about, about <laughs> pretending to be someone else. And I have to say that I kind of found the same category in a way, especially when I went after my career. I think I was the first out of the whole group to really just leave and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I had, I had dropped out of high school. I really wasn't going to school. Um, I got my GED, and then I wound up working in the Foot Locker and making that a, a career. I wound up getting stuck in retail. But I, I, I took it so fucking seriously. I, could, I was the youngest manager at 21 years old without a GED. Right. And to kind of compare Johnny to, to someone there, folks, we were in sync and Johnny was Justin Timberlake. <laughs> 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 he, he, he left the group to make his own powerful career. And... Yeah. uh Everybody still did their own thing, but you know, like we knew, we knew Johnny was gonna, he was gonna make the first impact. So go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, and uh, I, I, yeah, I left super early. I thought I was gonna be a great solo artist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, I had to, I had to put my myself away, because back in the day, I think what people need to understand is that when you're Hispanic or black, just brown or black in general. You couldn't be who you are. You had to be 10 times better than the average white person. And um, because I had no schooling, no formal education, I was always very well read. I always read books galore. You know what I'm saying? And whatever interests me, I always dove into it and really became a subject matter expert into it. But going through that and seeing how I always had to work with these white folks, and they had mediocre education. They weren't even like university taught, nothing, but they still were ahead of me. And I had to maneuver in a way that, so I can progress and be respected, just like they were respected. Not really respected because I'm the smart spick on the team, but respected because of who I am. You know what I'm saying? Right. And for mad years, I had to put my, my, my Brooklyn self away and fucking say, yo, this motherfucker can't be out here because if you if he is he's too real he's too gutter for people and they're gonna shy away from it and i'm like i can't represent myself in that way so i had to get prim and proper i had started reading more books i started looking at my dialogue like i changed up my whole way of speaking um 
to talk white. <laughs> you remember that shit? Like, um, yeah. Go, go back You're to the talking white. He's talking white again, this nigga. Like, you know, like, so it'd be like, but that's what you were forced to do. At least but that's what I thought I was forced to do, to fit in, to get ahead, because I didn't have a formal education. And I knew school wasn't for me. School was never for me. I knew I was, not that I was better than school, but it was nothing that I wanted to sit through. I knew I had more for myself. I always wrote as well. And um, you saying everything you said, I got, it just hit home because, yeah, I did that myself as well. I had to be in that industry. I had to be somebody else because I have a super hick name. It's I'm going to let everybody know. My name, my real name is not Johnny Nomad. <laughs> so that's my tag name, what they call back in the day. And um, my real name is Rafael San Onocencio, which is the crazy spickish. So... Having that name, I had you know come off paper. People were very soon. Oh, he he does only speak Spanish, and may not be that educated. And I had to really make sure my resume represented me of not being that. To a point to where almost I didn't want to speak Spanish on purpose because I didn't want to be associated with that, right? Because it almost took to a point to not learning, not knowing Spanish, being Puerto Rican, is like a Selena moment, right? Her father, I remember a scene of Selena, her father in the car was like, "You're Mexican, but you're not Mexican enough to be Mexican, and you're definitely not American enough to be American." And I felt I felt that way, that I wasn't Puerto Rican enough to be Puerto Rican, and I definitely wasn't American enough to be American. But I was Brooklyn enough. If that makes sense, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Brooklyn, Brooklyn is its own, its own world, its own thing. It's own world. You know what I'm saying? So, for you to say that, and and play, and then years later, I decided to. It started seeping out of me. It started to bubble up the real me. And um, this was probably back in 2012. I, I really started writing heavy. And I was like, um, I can't do this no more. I, I can't I can't keep it. It was exhausting. Did you find it to be exhausting for you to be pretending for as long as you was? Yeah, it, 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 it took, you know what? I didn't want to give it no more energy because everybody knows a little white lie snowballs into something big, and it has and to become it has to become true. Because now you have to have a story behind that that lie. It exactly, has to, become, it has to become a truth now. And now, when people ask you, you be like, "When I say that, oh, you said it this. Oh, yeah. Then you got to make up another lie. Then I'm not even saying it. So it's like, you know what? I'm tired of lying. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. Um, better for me. <laughs> better for me. If you don't want to fuck with me. You mean? Right. Perfect. You know what I'm saying. The less people in my life, the less people I gotta talk to. You know what I mean? The less people I gotta pretend, the less energy. You know what I'm saying like now I can use the energy on myself. All right. Um so yeah, you know, it's you know, I'm starting, you know, to to embrace self love, which is completely new to me as well. You mean because I never I never understood how to how to how to do it. Um. So you know it's 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 new. It's exciting. Um, it's scary. It's definitely scary. Um. Anybody told you that you know. Uh, it, 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 it's going to be easy. Um, immediately cut them out of your life because they're 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 bullshitters and they're liars. Right. Uh, except if, if it's your mom, don't do that. Um, <laughs> um, because people who truly love you and want the best for you will tell you the truth. Um, and for myself, I had to be that person. Not only am I building the person in front of me, but I also had to be that person to say, yo, we're going to go do this and everything's going to be all right. Right. It's not like I don't have people in my life, you know what I mean, stuff like that, but you know what? There's a certain barrier between reality oneself and your soul that you have to keep. Hmm. Uh, because 
you know how we always say back in the day, yo, there's a lot of layers to this shit. Yeah. There's a lot of layers to this thing called life. We only have one. Don't fuck it up. Right. You know, um, and, you know, I, I really started embracing this poetry. And, you know, if Johnny doesn't mind, I don't know, I would like to read one. Absolutely, bro. Um, oh, I, go right I, ahead. I have, I have, a, I have a few, um, but I want to go back to the, um, the smoking mad weed, um, you know, puffing on weed. No, I, 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 I try to, I try to write a poem almost every, every other day or every day. It really depends on the mood. Sure. No, I, I wake up in. You know, I, I, I sent you one of mine yesterday called Flight. Flight. Uh, of the. I'm, I'm not sure if you you guys able to read it or not. Um, yes, I did. And I wrote that a few years ago, and um, that you know, and I'm I'm always writing, but that flight was was when I made the conscious decision that yo, I'm stuck. I I knew I knew that I had to make a move. Like I told you back in 2012, I knew I knew something was different. I knew something I had to I had to make a different move, and I had missed my plane. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I had. Because I, I've traveled the country so much, right? Which was a beautiful thing. You know, I've I've been to Vegas. You know, I've I've been to Chicago. I've been, you know, uh, to Orlando. Uh, I've been to Phoenix, St. Louis, um, Virginia, North of Virginia. Because my job has always had me traveling, which is fantastic. And, but again, it was, uh, it was, it wasn't, it was a facade. You know what I'm saying? It was like, I was, it was cool. I was doing that, you know what I'm saying? No doubt about it. I got to see different places, but you know, flight came from that when I knew I was just like not there, but there. So right. when when um when Vegas sent me his his poetry yesterday, he had two of them, and um I was reading it. It it really touched to home. I'm not sure I'm gonna read any one of these. Um. But the one that really connected to me the most was um, life's New Testament, and and the way you spelled the test, I I meant. Um, I love that one. Yeah, so I'm gonna read the preclude to that. I read okay. the preclude. Um, like I say, it really depends. You know, the one thing I I I, I embrace about meditation. Uh, and yoga is that you wake up, they say you wake up different every day. Right. Um, and sometimes it's less energy or more energy that you need to embrace or include in that day to get where you need to be. Um, and what I do every morning, I meditate, I pray. And when I pray, I ask for energy and guidance. And the guidance, you know what I'm saying? I say, please show me what I need to write about today. And I write, and that's what I write about. And for myself, I had an epiphany, if you want to call that, right? Um, and hopefully later on, you're saying, I'm going to reveal that, you're know saying, um, um, I would love to be a, a guest again uh, in, in the future. And Absolutely. Conti- this... And continue that way as well. But to stay yeah. on subject with the poetry, um, this is one I wrote uh Maybe a couple of, because I, I, I literally just started writing poetry maybe like maybe five weeks ago. Literally picked up a, picked up the pen and started flowing. Like, and it, mind I have not written poetry in years, maybe close to a decade. Okay. And, but the energy in my head told me, yo, you need to pick up the pen and write your story. Um, and that's what I started doing. Now, to go on to this poem is... Anybody knows about, you know, religion, you know, we hear about, you know, 
the universal souls and you know blah 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 you know we hear about the devil aka satan aka lucifer you know all those things you're saying but what people don't understand is the devil is really the negativity in your head it's a metaphor the devil is a huge it's a metaphor meta- it's, a, it's a metaphor for the person that is controlling you to be in a negative state which is your own mind so the poem goes like this <clears throat> now i'm sorry if i get emotional because i am very emotional attached to my poems uh, because it's some real shit now i'm gonna read this one then i'm gonna go into the one that you know rob talked about you know right so this one is called the great deception All right, the devil let's do is it. It's called The Great Deception. The devil is the sheep and the wolf. Um, And it starts off like this. Who am I? It's the greatest question of this life. Let me rephrase the question. Who do I want to be? The confusion is definitely. The devil stands here in plain sight. Its disguises have many levels. Many levels still unfound. Levels could be relationships, families, friends. The thought is too profound. Trust trust your judgment, they say, but judgment could be quick. It can't disappear in a flash. The devil understands judgment. He's quick and witty. He gifts us ego. God calls it the clash. He's intelligent and takes notes. Also takes no prisoners. He also gave us the power of pride and depression. The two combined equals victory. He's trying to get rid of us. But Lucifer is crafty with his words. Remember, he was once an angel. But greed made him the devil. It overtook his soul. But his soul is to be remembered. They mention his soul in the book they call Great. But this, fool, but this soul is not to be fooled with. It could cause death. Death is the father's fate. But what was once took and replaced. Remember, he's crafty. He is strong. He is brave. The mind is his final mastery. He taught himself how to play God's game. Now, he's the author of this book, Life, My Greatest Hoax. The next level is the mind, but jokes on us, the mind he already took. So just remember, the devil wears nada. He's, he's, a, he's evil and a full-time member. A member of this club, not woke, a.k.a. the mind's final slumber. Wow. Where did, where did that one come from? You know, <clears throat> it came from being not woke. It, it came from being asleep. And everybody knows who knows hip hop knows you never sleep because sleep is the cousin of death. It's asleep. I was asleep because I allowed the double to take over. Because I didn't know, I didn't want to know myself no more. Because I didn't know myself no more. So, in a sense, depression took over and I didn't want to wake up. I was living a mental suicide. Man. Real talk. Yeah. That's real shit. Damn, bro. That's good shit. That's good shit. And then, uh, you know, something that, you know, I w- the, 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 the problem today that I'm seeing is that, you know, what our parents taught us and what we're learning today and what we're about to teach our children, there's a, there's a, there's a lack of communication. And that communication is the inability to connect, to adapt right. with the times. Right. So I went and I decided <clears throat> that I wanted to write, you know, it's called the ultimate name to it. You know, there's going to be multiple stories to it. It's called the Bible Chronicles. Right. And the first story to it is called the, the story of Jay. Right. Because everybody can relate to Jay. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? 
Now, if I if I tell everybody, hey, this is the story of Jesus, half of the audience is already gone. Right? right. People want something relatable. Right? So I decided, yo, I'm going to make a new age story about the Bible. Because what people don't realize is that the Bible was written by man. But there also is also instructions how to live your life in a righteous way. Right. Right. So this is my, and, and I, and I explained, you know, I, I met a long time friend yesterday. Um, it's funny cause I spoke to Ralph in the morning, right. Morning time, noonish time, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, and then afterwards I went to go meet another friend. Um, and I read her the same poem and she was like, Daniel, we need to make this into a play. Can you write a script? I was like, I never wrote a script, but my boy has wrote a book that I spoke to earlier. And she was like, yo, we need to do this. We need to do this. Um, let's, and I was let's, like, wow. let's do it. I was like, yo, let's do it. We'll be the, so, the John Leguizamo duo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the poem is could hit close to home. It can hit wherever it wants. So um, the title is Resurrection, the second coming, life's new test I meant, right? So if you break down testament, you know, it has a lot of different meanings to it, you know what I mean? Um, so what I decided to do was, you know, test I and meant. So this is a test that is meant for you today. Right, you broke it up to three different words. Three different words. Test dot I dot meant. Right. Um, and it goes like this. Why am, why am I being tested? Why was I chosen to be resurrected? Why was I given another number? This won't be the first time. Guess I have to try again. The great book always mentioned the second coming. How many tears of blood must I shed? I already died for some BS. The world just needs to take it easy. Let ignorance go to bed. I try to forget the time my boy stabbed me in the back. For real, my dudes? Even after we broke bread? That's how you repay a ninja back? But it's all good, peeps. But it's all good. I forgave my peeps. I was given the power to rise. That power also gave me the choice to bury your sins beside me. My dad always mentioned, be careful, Jay. Not all your mans will ride with you. I don't understand. All I was trying to do was help. I really tried to just to forgive, but my heart already deceived me. I was also blessed with the evil power of guilt. It's not like I was born with riches. We were all raised in the slums. Talked about the future. My magic had everyone in stitches. Weekends were great. We all kicked it in my crib. My mom's always cooked. We even turned it up even more when I learned how to turn water into this liquid red. Those times made me laugh, but I have to cut you guys out of my life. I can't allow betrayal again. I won't live my life in trife. For that sake, I was crucified, even beaten to a pope. You allow me to get jumped, but I won't be fooled again. I won't allow myself to be double crossed. So here I go again, trying to save the day, the resurrection, the second coming. Dad mentioned, son, this is your new test I meant for you today. So, you know, it's it, it's very relatable to, you know, you know what we seem to be going through as a culture these days. It's like, nobody's real no more. And who can you really trust to have your back but yourself? It's because it the culture, be way. well, society hasn't allowed us to really appreciate who we are as our own culture, as being Puerto Ricans or Hispanics, right? And we, you know, we, we grew up in a way that we always had to be like the other culture, right? Like, like the white white folks who were really the majority that we saw growing up. Now in today's time, 
that's different. Now we're seeing pride, and Puerto Ricans always have pride of who we are, but we kind of lost it a little bit in the sense of that that we had to compete and we had to kind of suppress it, and we couldn't just be who we really are. And now I think because of the new generation, it's allowing our generation to say, "Yo, I want to come back and I want to be truly me." I want to give, truly give you the true definition of who I am, of who I am, Vega, of who I am. You know what I'm saying? And this is where you have to continue on with your acceptance of who you are. Because right now, that's the stage that you're in. You're, you're redefining yourself. You're going after acceptance of who you are. You come to terms of saying, yo, my flaw is, is, is me. It's okay to be as flawed as I am. My perfection is because of how, how flawed I am. My greatness is because of maybe be, me being indecisive at times but making decisions later. That's all part of you. You're not meant to have every fucking answer. You're not meant to be the man every fucking time. You know, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with as well. So you want to surround yourself with the dopest people. You know what I'm saying? So that way you can really be appreciated for who the fuck you are. At the end of the day, if we all just trying to pretend that means the people we're surrounding ourselves with is just a fucking audience and not even really our true friends because we're not true to them. Right. We haven't allowed them to be one with us. You know what I'm saying? So as you go we through this been. fucking... You know what I'm saying? That makes sense? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't allowed time. No, not at all. You know, I, all. I'm, I mean, wifey, we, we, we bugged out because she's like, yo, like, you don't have friends. I said, I have friends. I have mad people I know. I was right. like, I have true friends that I grew up with, you know, like I said, the one forty families so I actually consider my true friends. I have maybe one boy I've met in Atlanta that I, I fuck with, my boy Ken. And that's it. That's in the 18 years I've been here. I now don't get me wrong, I know a lot of people. Like, um, I can make a phone call and say, yo, let's do this, and they'll fuck with me. But again, those are because I made a network of folks. You know what I'm saying? Calling someone a friend, it means a lot to me. Like I can't dilute that word, which I feel a lot of people do dilute that word. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, absolutely. So they also I, dilute the word love. Absolutely. And then and that's where if I call you a friend, it's, it's for sure because you're my friend. Like, so if if I fuck with you, it's in a strength of because what you can do for me now or later, and vice versa, what I can do for you now. And it's a give and take. And it's time for us at a day and age now. As you accept yourself, who you are, possibly even maybe, um, hopefully, you, work, you know, work out your marriage and shit, and bring her into the new light with you, and and build off of that. Because I got married a year ago, so a phenomenal woman, um, remarried my second marriage, and I'm not doing it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah. um, but she has given me and the allowance of me just to be me. And she calls me fucking extra. She says, yo, you're too damn dramatic. You're extra. <laughs> and I, I love her for it because she's from the Bronx. So um, she's Florida already because she's from the Bronx. I can't tell her she's from upstate New York from Canada. So, yeah. <laughs> so but um, so all that being said, man, it's like now I have the right people around me. You know what I'm saying? I want to have a focused group of people around me based off what I need at this moment in time in life. Now, as I continue to grow my goals and my, and, and my, and my aspirations for 2019, you know, starting in 2018, mid to late 2018, doing this podcast, writing the books in the summertime, to saying, hey, what are you really going to do and push this year 2019? What is your, your true goals? And who are the people that you're going to need to get you there? No doubt it's going to be a lot of my work, but you still need help. You still need inspiration, motivation, and then motivation is fickle. It's temporary, right? People make resolutions all the time. They go to the gym for two months and then they quit. Because motivation is like, a, is like an adrenaline shot. You, yeah. So you got to have that drive. So what is what, so all me saying all that is <clears throat> how does Danny know that what you're feeling is just not a motivational shot, like an adrenaline shot? Like this is going to be something you really drive to to get who you back, to get get back who you are. Because this is the first thing that I've ever done in my life that I literally cry every time I do it. And I feel great. That's dope. I literally, before every single poetry writing, 
cry. Sometimes I cry during it. Sometimes I got to stop because my eyes are too blurry. Um, because this is coming from the heart, and that's the only way I know how to be. Are you redefining the man that you want to become now? Absolutely. You know, I have this one line in one poem. And it says, you know, what's the greatest thing about what you're going through is that with this, not only do you get a second chance, but it also comes with a shiny new pair of scissors. (laughs) And people that are going through what they're going through understand what that means. Right. It's not going to be easy. But you're going to have to cut off a lot of attachments. Because people think attachments is like, oh, the more attachments I have, like I'm Iron Man. Yeah, but do you, do you understand that stuff is made out of iron and it's going to weigh you down? The only reason Iron Man goes the way he goes is because he's a he's a scientist and an engineer. He has rocket propulsion. <laughs> you know I mean? Right. Like if you don't, if you don't got that rocket propulsion, you ain't going nowhere with all that weight. All right. You know I mean so? You know you know it's it's you know it's a time of your life where you know you have to make a lot of decisions on. The past, and um, and people relate the past to like, oh, a couple of months ago. No, no, the past could be five minutes ago. Yeah. Every second that goes by, that's the past. You know, um, and you know that, that that's a lot of things that you know you is a lot of hard decisions, and you know, because. The funny thing is people want to know what lies ahead of them, right? But people don't respect the journey. They don't respect the process at all. They don't respect, you know what I'm saying? They want the answers, but when they get an answer, they don't like it. Mm -hmm. So they throw it back. Nah, I don't like this. I ain't going to fuck with this. All right, so you're not ready. Because... Life is only going to show you what you are ready for. If you ain't ready for it, it ain't going to show you. And a lot of people ain't ready. No. Because everybody lives an IG life. Absolutely. Everyone lives their best life on IG, right? So, Mm -hmm. and this is where my IG, like, I, 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 I speak from the heart of my podcast. I have genuine people on because I didn't want my podcast to be a reflection of something, like I said in the past, and like for you said yourself, something that was just a pretend type of thing. I wanted to have real conversations with real people and have real stories for people to relate to. Because what we talked about today, and when people hear this podcast when it comes out, a lot of people are going to be like, damn. They're going to start taking inventory and start evaluating what they're doing. And you have to take inventory of yourself. You have to take inventory of your situation. You have to audit yourself and really come to terms with, what am I doing for me? How am I living my life? Like I, Me and my wife, we are, we are super in sync, which is crazy weird. I never thought I could experience that with someone. Right. But we, she allows me to be me and I allow her to be her. And... um. That has been the the best and biggest gift I have ever gotten from anyone, and she continues to prom- to promote me. She continues to be my my champion and, and my cheerleader when I need her to be. She also continues to be my my honest feedback. And she's rugged and rock. She's shooting the Bronx, so she'll tell me straight out, like, "Yo, you're fucking up. Get your shit together." <laughs> she'll tell me right. just like that, and like, that's what you shit. need. Yeah, like, yeah, and that's, that's and she, she'll be she straight out like, "Yo." You fucking up, bro. Let's get it together. Like, what's going on with you right now? Speak to me. And she, she's definitely my fucking best friend. And she should. She's my fucking wife. Um, and that's where you have to realize 
And before you love somebody else, you have to definitely love yourself. Yeah. And you have to know what self-care looks like. And being selfish is not a bad thing. It's only if you're not conscious of it. You know, you have to ensure that you take care of yourself. Like, I can't be a good father, good husband if I'm not well. I can't provide for my family if I'm not well. Not just physically, but spiritually, mentally. Right? Uh, I can't be a good friend if I'm, if I'm not well. And you said earlier about doing yoga, really figuring out spiritually how to get back in tune and meditate. And meditation, I think people need to understand, could be any sort of form of activity that gets you in sync with yourself. You don't have to sit mm-hmm. in a quiet room with music on a carpet, your legs folded. Yeah. You yeah, can wear just, funny pants. Right, exactly. You you can you can fucking start cleaning your house, fucking rock out to whatever music you love by yourself to get yourself straight again. You know what I'm saying? It's things like that that um you have to really get in tune with. And uh, we don't we don't take enough breaks because we're always in the grind. And at, you know, grinding is cool, don't get me wrong. But grinding is exhausting as well. And we have to stop always saying we're going to grind and hustle. I always tend to look at those terms as a negative term because, you know, when you're hustling, and, you know, people probably disagree with me, that's fine. But for me, growing up in, in, in New York and Brooklyn, when you're a hustler, you know, you were always trying, always trying, trying, trying. You never actually got to do something. You know what I'm saying? You hustled on the side for a reason because your main shit wasn't really working for you. Right, you you grind it because that's all you had, you had the survival mode in you because you had to have it because you're in the hood. And my mother taught me survival because she was great at surviving, but she was never good at living. She could never teach me how to fucking live properly. She always taught me how to survive though. Any hood I can go to, I know I can fucking make it in any hood. And then I know how to respect the hood. I know how to, I know how to learn the language of the hood, how I move, how to walk. I know how to but to live. I was never taught that. And this is where now I'm taking advantage of my life and saying, I want to learn how to live properly in the space that I want to be in, my creative space. Like me being this podcast, me writing like I've never written before, you know, to come up with these stories. I'm really finally feeling like my joy and fulfillment. You know what I'm saying? Unlike other 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 years in the past, because I put that away. Cause I thought, yo. I can't monetize this. Who the fuck wants to read this, this little Puerto Rican kid's stories from Brooklyn? I always doubted my writing. And I wrote for years. I wrote have crazy stories that it's unfinished because I stopped myself saying, yo, you're not worthy, my man. Like, you can't put this out. People will laugh at you. And I was like, I can't do that no more. I can't hold all this information inside of me and die and never even have tried to come up with something. No, you know what I'm saying, bro? Selfish. Exactly. So now, you know, when I, when I use grind and hustle, it's a temporary term. Just like I said, when motivation is kind of temporary and fickle. It's an adrenaline shot. Like, if I'm starting out, I'm going to grind out, no doubt. But I need to get away from grinding out, and then I need to make it happen. My execution has to be fucking on point. I got to make sure I schedule some, some shit. I got to have strategic planning to ensure that this is going forward. You know what I'm saying? Because grinding is not going to give you all that. I could work hard and beat anybody out all day long if I need to. I could work 18, 19 hours in a day, but is that is that really doing me any justice? Because at the end of the day, we're not in competition with each other. We're in competition with ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Right now, you're in competition with yourself to be the best person you can be. It doesn't matter who else is around you. And until you realize that and can gravitate to that, that's when you're really going to fucking win. You know what I'm saying? Because it's not a competition. Even with your poetry, bro. Your poetry is banging. If you fucking love it, that's the only validation you fucking need. That's why I had to realize when I started writing my books. And there's always going to be an audience for you. The seven billion people on this fucking planet. You don't think out of those seven billion people, you're going to get a fraction of those who are going to fuck with you? Who are going to say, yo, you're the fucking poet for them? You know what I'm saying? There's no difference between me doing this fucking podcast. Our, everyone's going to listen to me. Probably not. But am I going to touch some people out there? Probably so. If I can get 1% of 7000000000 billion, I'm good, my bro. I'm good, my man. You know what I'm saying, my guy? I'm really good. Mm-hmm. I'm only looking for that 1%. And you should as well, too. Now, if I can grow on that, no doubt, I'm going to go after it. But 
focus on you. Continue fucking writing. Continue fucking feeling the feelings that you you have and don't harbor those feelings no more. Those days are over. Become the man you truly want to be. So then from there, you can really figure out who you want to be with. If even that's an option, if you want to have it. Because you don't have to be with anybody. You know what I'm saying? And that person should really truly be a reflection of what you're trying to get to as well. Okay, it makes no sense to be with somebody who it doesn't know who the fuck they are. They got to go through their own journey. Like you don't have time for shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to read one last one. I know we're Let's do it. probably let out of time, and I just wanted to end this. Uh, but first, I just wanted to thank. I'm not gonna call you John anymore. Uh, I want to take. I want to thank Ralph. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, you know, for having me on and, you know, really um, reaching out and really it's always a wonderful thing to reconnect and, and revive and because I think we have a serious story to tell and I'm really excited to go on this journey with you. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I feel really honored um, to be on this podcast and to be on future um, discussions as well. Hey, maybe yeah. we have you on once a month. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And you just come on. We just we just chop it up about current events, current things that's happening. Um, that's good. We can do that. Maybe we can definitely talk about doing a play. You know what I'm saying? Get some some draft work done. Get some ideas going. I'm down for all that, bro. Because honestly, with the story we have living in the projects, that could be a whole play of its own, brother. You know what I'm saying? So we can talk about the weekend. <laughs> ab- absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, absolutely. So I, I, I think, you know, this this uh, this poem I wrote yesterday and, uh, you know, we, we spoke about, you know, smoking weed and how I was the the project prophet, um, which I think I'm going to keep that name. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we used to smoke weed and we used to talk about space, time and stars and moons and shit. Um, and it was awesome. You know what I mean? Because everybody wanted to hear you say what I had to say because I was always saying some wild shit. Right. Um, so, you know, I wrote this you know, poem yesterday, you know, it's called Time. And it's actually an acronym. And the acronym uh, goes like this, Theoretical Infinite Mass Energy, Time. Uh, and the poem starts like this. What is time? Why can't we get more of it? Where has it gone? When does it want us present? How is it in of the essence? So many questions, yet so little time. Answers can be given, yet we can't contribute time. Time has many sides, but can't be confined within walls. Time will help us rise within, but wasting it creates gluttony, a short downfall. Time will teach us to grow. Time will speed up and slow us down. Time is also manipulative. It can control pace with no ground. This time, time is of, of the essence. It even teaches us patience. Just ask the hare next time, who's the, fastest, who's the fastest turtle winning all the time, every time at the races. Time heals, this is also true. Time also reveals intention, so in time, it also reveals the truth. Time and time again, we also face dilemmas. Decisions, decisions. Don't use the time to overthink. Time will get ahead of us. Over time, you can see time just fade away. In due time, our time has a, has an expiration. The clock meets its fate. So use this time for good. Time doesn't last long. Time is present, also limited. Don't do time wrong. I took this time to show you time. Time doesn't have a face. No hands, no numbers. Time is an infinite energy that lives in a timeless space. So next time we meet, let's remember the times that we last. Time has limits, but fair. Time doesn't last. Let's end it like that, brother. Let's end it right there. Vega from Vegas, thank you, my brother. You are truly my blood brother. You know that for real, bro. Yeah, I know. Um, guys, this was a special time. This was a special conversation for a very, very special person to me in my life. 
um, and we're going to continue this conversation because we're not going to lose each other no more. Those days are over. And my co- the notes. Exactly. Well, that's a little fugazi. But okay. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to we're gonna keep it real. Not that real. But we're going to keep it real. We're going to keep and it close. We're going to keep it close. Real close. Like, like, a, like a fitted to your dome. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and... Um, we're gonna definitely have Vega back on. Maybe we'll do a whole like like maybe a series type of thing. We'll see what it looks like. But brother, thank you for really truly being honest because as a man, what you did today, I I, I applaud you. I thank you. You really have given us your story and was very honest and open um with everyone. And that takes a lot of balls. You know what I'm saying? And um thank you for that, for sharing your story. And um continue doing you, bro. You got this. I'm here for you. And like I said, we're not going to lose contact with each other again. Um, so we're going to make that shit happen for real. Join on my presents today, Daniel Vega. We're out. Peace. Peace.